Welcome to episode 3 of my DCS World series, Learning to Fly, where I describe how I went about learning to fly the FA-18C Hornet in DCS World. Flash out. Today we're tackling two different subjects that are immensely popular with people who are learning to fly the Hornet in DCS World. That is, learning how to land the airplane on the aircraft carrier in learning how to conduct an air-to-air -air refuel. Let's start by talking about learning how to land. My first piece of advice is that you start to learn how to land on the airfield. You're gonna be tempted to spawn in your fighter and go straight to the carrier and try to figure out how to catch a wire and enjoy that crazy experience. And you'll get there. Believe me, I was tempted to go that route immediately just like you are. But I've gotta recommend that you go to the airfield and you practice learning on the solid ground first. Best way to learn how to do this is to watch Matt Wagner's VFR Rules Landing Tutorial on YouTube. After you watch it, give it a shot. Try the in-game tutorial. It's exactly what I did. There's one thing that I wanna recommend as a huge tip and then describe to you why I think it's important despite the fact that you're gonna hear it over and over again regardless of which tutorial you watch and regardless of which YouTube video you watch and even when you try the in-game tutorials. That is, learning how to fly on speed, angle of attack is the most important skill that you can have when performing a landing on the field or on the carrier. What I mean by an on speed angle of attack, which you hear so frequently it becomes a buzzword, it almost becomes meaningless, we say it so much. But in the Hornet, on speed angle of attack means that as you are descending, the nose of your aircraft is actually raised above the plane of the flat ground beneath you approximately eight degrees so you are coasting in with your nose just a little bit up so that you are presenting to the earth or to the boat your arresting hook that when you land on the aircraft carrier will catch a wire the reason this is so counterintuitive particularly to those of us who have played other flight simulators but haven't done any naval aviation kind of stuff, is that it goes against some of the things you do in other airplanes. The F-18 does not require you to flare. You are not required to raise your nose just a little bit more right there at the end to have that sweet butter smooth landing. Guys, the F-18 was made for crashing into a aircraft carrier, not for that butter smooth field landing. And it took me forever to figure out that that is the case. Now, I'm gonna to describe to you just a little bit of what you can expect and what you can do on the field, and then we'll move on to talking a little bit about refuel and then about the carrier. Once you watch those tutorials, once you understand what it means to fly that on-speed angle of attack, once you're comfortable with the patterns in and around the airfield, which are described to you in all of those tutorials, both in-game and in the Matt Wagner tutorial, I recommend that you do touch and goes on the airfield over and over and over again. You're gonna get more repetitions this way. It's easier to set up a custom mission and you don't have to wait your turn or navigate a bunch of complicated communications menus and you can just get a ton of repetitions practicing the same pattern that you're gonna end up flying whenever you get to the aircraft carrier so that when you finally get out to sea, it's gonna be that much easier. I did this and guys, frankly, I'm still not great at landing. However, I did manage to have this one incredibly special moment with my buddy Will Foes where we were on the way back from our second sortie of the night. Actually, it was the second sortie I had ever flown in a multiplayer mission. And I was coming in left side of the active runway and we were doing a formation landing. Naturally, he let me take lead and he flew formation off of me because my aviation skills weren't there. But I did manage to find that on-speed AOA. I was a little bit heavier than him. And so our approach was just a little bit different because the weight of the aircraft required us to fly at slightly different speeds. But nonetheless, he came in just off my right wing and we had this really cool moment where, you know, I was coming after a successful mission. I look over using my track IR and I see him off my right wing and, and here we are as a team coming back from that successful op. And once you kind of manage to master these skills, those are the really cool moments you get to enjoy in DCS world. Now that we've talked about landing on the field, let's talk about refuel. And why am I choosing to talk about refueling before I talk about the carrier? Well, it's because 
whenever you're at sea and you're practicing landing on the carrier, it's gonna take a couple times for you to catch a wire. And I found myself in a position where I've done a few go arounds and I'm just burning gas and burning gas and burning gas. And I need to go up and I need to hit the tanker and get some fuel before I can go back and continue getting my attempts and that's okay. So let's talk about what it means and how you can go about learning how to refuel in an effective way. First, there's two ways that you can find a place to gas. First, you can use the SA page on the Hornet. So if you know that there is a tanker in the area and you open up the communications menu and you contact that tanker's call sign, presuming of course that you are on the correct frequency, then he will provide you with the altitude that he is flying at as well as the bearing from your aircraft to him. You can then look down on the situational awareness page on any of your DDIs. I typically put it on the multifunctional color display on the bottom because it's the largest screen. And you can locate that tanker on the SA page and then fly a bearing to him until you're within visual contact. And then you can navigate up to his rear. The other way, and I think it's probably good to use both of these methods, is to use the TACAN system. Just like you would to navigate to an airfield, uh, most of the refueling tankers in DCS World have the ability to activate a TACAN radio channel. And you can simply look in the mission briefing for most missions that you're in. And you can plug the TACAN channel into your navigation system and then pull up your HSI and box the TACAN option and it will give you a bearing to the location of that aircraft. In reality, you'll end up using a combination of these two things. So you'll activate TACAN, fly towards the bearing that is indicated on the TACAN that will also give you a distance. Then you'll also look down on the SA page and you'll understand what altitude that that aircraft is at and you'll be able to use all of that information to ultimately find the tanker that you're looking for. And if you find that I'm speaking complete gibberish right now, I've linked some other tutorials on screen that are going to help you figure out all of this stuff. Okay, now you find yourself behind the tanker for the very first time. Here is the tip. This is the most important thing probably that I can share with you if you are a rookie pilot. And that is, you are probably not using a $300 flight stick. You're probably using something like I have, the Thrustmaster T-16. And that's perfectly fine. It's a great stick. You might be using one of the other similar variants from the competitors, but the reality is these sticks do not have an extension. They have less play in them than some of the sticks that these veterans who have been playing this game for a long time have. That Their sticks are sometimes 6, 8, 10, 12 inches tall. They've got these stick extensions. And because of that, they can put do these tiny little inputs into the flight controls of the airplane that they're using and achieve this level of precision that is almost impossible to achieve with the flight sticks that we're using. In order to compensate for this, you can go into the settings and you can put what is called curves into the axis control of your flight stick. I'm showing you on screen right now what that looks like. Somewhere between 15 and 30 will be appropriate to allow you to achieve a level of precision that will enable you to effectively conduct an air-to-air -air refuel. Whenever I made this one change, I immediately increase my effectiveness at air-to-air -air refuel tenfold, and that is not an exaggeration. So I would encourage you to do the same if you are using a budget flight stick, like I am. All right, now we're behind the tanker, and we have navigated to him successfully, and we have the correct controls set up on our stick. Then it raises the next question. Is this even a tanker that you can refuel at? Remember, I'm flying the F-18. You guys might be flying something similar. Hopefully, you're flying the F-18 as well, because, hey... It's my favorite aircraft so far, and I think it's the best way to get into DCS World in a multi-role capacity. Well, the F-18 has a fuel probe on the front. You can flick a switch, and the fuel probe comes out, and you got to stick that probe in the basket of the tanker to start taking fuel and continue your mission. The two preferred airframes for that are going to give you gas, typically, are going to be the KC-130 and the KC-135. But the KC-135 must be the MPRS variant. I say that because a typical KC-135 has a fuel boom only that will refuel aircraft like the F-16, but is unable to provide you the basket to stick the fuel probe in on the F-18. So make sure that you know what kind of tank you're chasing down so that by the time you get there, it hasn't been a complete waste of time and that you're able to actually take gas from the tanker in question. Once you get your fuel probe deployed and you've done all the radio communication to get them to extend the line, 
and you're ready to start working your way up to the basket and try to get the plug, some general advice is that one, you just do tiny, tiny little incremental changes to your attitude and pitch to try to line up your fuel put probe with the basket. And then the second and the most important tip I can give you for actually getting the probe in the basket is to take it very, very slow and constantly manipulate your throttle. The F-18 specifically has a delay from the time you input direction into your throttle and the time the engines spool and reflect that. So when I am refueling, before, during, and after I get the plug, I am constantly tweaking the level of input in my throttle. A little bit forward, a little bit back, a little bit forward, a little bit back, a little bit forward, a little bit back. And I'm frequently making adjustments before the engines are even catching up to the instructions that I am providing it. And it is the only way to maintain the, a tight enough formation and maintain the level of precision and control required to get the probe into the basket, take fuel, and then actually hear those magical words. Transfer complete. Disconnect. Let's go. I'm up and out left. All right, we've made it to the culminating event. Here we go. Let's talk about what it takes to land on the aircraft carrier in DCS world. First, here is the tip. I talked about it a little bit about the, at the beginning of the episode, and I want to talk about it again now. And that is to fly the pattern that you are provided in the tutorial, and the YouTube video I'd like to recommend to you is the Jabber's Case 1 Carrier Recovery Tutorial video. It is simply the best guide to landing on an aircraft carrier in DCS world on the internet, period. Once you've learned how to fly the pattern, you need to learn to trust your AOA indexer. That's that magical E bracket on the left side of your velocity vector indicator. You also need to learn to trust your ICLS. And then just like when you were refueling, you need to work the throttle constantly in order to stay on glide slope and stay on speed and maintain that on speed angle of attack. You're not going to find that magical speed that you can just ride all the way in at the perfect glide slope. It doesn't happen. You're going to be manipulating the throttle from the time you get in into the groove all the way to the very end and you finally catch that magical three while wire. And then finally, the entire process is going to feel like a crash. Nothing about landing on the aircraft carrier, even in DCS world, feels safe. The whole thing feels out of control. Even now, after I managed to do it with some frequency, it feels like it's an out of control experience, despite the fact that I believe I am doing a lot of it right. Whether or not you're landing on the supercarrier or the Stennis, the procedures are going to be generally the same. If you do have the supercarrier module and you are using that module in your mission, it's going to require that you use more radio communication to describe exactly where you are in the pattern to the tower and then to the landing deck and finally to the LSO. And that's perfectly fine. It's all easily navigatable in the communications menus. If you're on the Stennis, all you've got to do is tell the carrier inbound and they're going to be ready to receive you and that's perfectly fine. Guys, I failed so much. I hit ramp strikes over and over again. I didn't have enough power. Then I added too much power and I was boltering. I was flying over the deck. I am still constantly not able to line up correctly because for whatever reason, the basic recovery course is just beyond me. And you should expect to fail too, but you should also expect to learn. I can't say that I've ever made an attempt to land on the carrier that I didn't learn from. I always flew away or restarted the instance depending on how poorly it went, knowing a little bit more than when I started. I want to finish by describing this final tip one more time. Fly the pattern, trust your AOA indexer, trust your ICLS, work the throttle constantly, and remember, it's going to feel like a crash. When I say trust your AOA indexer, that means put the velocity vector indicator on that E bracket just to its left. This took forever for me to figure out, guys. Once you get that velocity vector pegged to the E bracket just to its left by using your trim and only your trim to achieve it, do not put any elevation or pitch control into your ailerons from that point forward with anything other than your trim. It's okay to roll a little bit to correct your lineup, but do not push your nose forward or pull your nose back by manipulating the stick. If you need to push your nose forward or pull your nose up, use your trim to do that. 
so that you are not moving outside of your on-speed angle of attack and so that your velocity vector indicator remains pegged to the E-bracket just to its left. If you need to raise your nose more, you need to add speed to do it. When you add power, your nose is going to rise. When you reduce power, your nose is going to fall. So as you turn out of your downwind leg and you're making your crosswind turn into the groove, you need to add power because you're no longer generating lift as those wings turn to 30 or 40 degrees in that last turn. And then as you level back off, you're going to have to reduce power because your wings are going to get some lift back. But then you're going to add power and continue to manipulate that throttle all the way in to the boat. When it clicks, it clicks. You'll start catching wires like it's nothing. I'm still waiting for it to click myself. But there is nothing more rewarding in this game that I have found so far than launching from the aircraft carrier, striking your target, refueling air to air on the way back, and then landing aboard the carrier once more. An example of that is on screen right now, and I hope you'll take the time to watch it. My name's Controlled Pairs. I play the most immersive PC games in the world. This is DCS World, and I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>